we have two huntsmen. They go for bird hunting. So um, they both are equally bad. They can hit only like 20% of the time. They see like 150 birds atop a tree. Um, the first guy hit, hits three shots, and then after that, the second guy hits. Can you compute how many birds the second guy hit? Sure. But why? Did you all agree to that? <laughs> okay. Okay. So that's that's true. So, um, so one of the things that that you should remember when you when you develop something new is that, or build some product, or do machine learning is is to keep the big picture in mind and don't do things against nature. Um, so uh, the, the reason why uh, that is, is the, when you build machine learning models, your models are only as good as your features, whatever goes into your features. Uh, now, you, you can ask what features are. They are, they are what you gather from your training data. Uh, you can also create new features from existing features. So things that you would have heard about, principal competent analysis, you reduce the dimensions, or if you want to increase the dimensions, you can find combinations of them, uh, interactions between the variables. You can keep your feature space as simple as possible or as complicated as possible. Uh, I mean, uh, we will, we will come to it. So, when, so one of the key, in, the key input to a machine learning model is your training data. So this process of getting your features, uh, creating your required features, they all take a hell of a lot of time. Uh, some problems that you would see that you can try different kinds of models. You can probably try a linear regression model and a random forest model. They're, very different, and they can result in extremely different results. Uh, so it's one of the reasons why it produces different reasons is that even though the, your inputs are the same, the feature space it searches over is entirely different. So it can result in entirely different place of your solution space where it searches over. And it finds a solution from that. And that, that's what the algorithm decides. Uh, so when you have these complexities, think about something that if you're building a machine learning model, what do you, what do you see? You, you have tremendous varieties of models that you can fit. Things like you can build uh, regression-based models like linear regression, logistic regression. You can build tree-based models like random forest, gradient boosting, or you can even build really black box models like neural networks, deep learning. Uh, they all come with their own set of parameters. Uh, we call that the parameters of the models are called hyperparameters. Uh, and also the next thing is your number of features. So do you just go with what you see, or do you want to compute more features? Do you want to add interaction effects? Uh, do you want to compress them using some dimensionality reduction techniques? Uh, so this is really, I mean, if you think about all the combinations that you want to do, it, it takes a hell of a lot of time. And it's definitely not possible to do it in finite amount of time. Uh, there are way, some ways to approach this problem. By far, one of the most powerful techniques is to use ensemble models. Uh, so now, to answer the question about what an ensemble is, let's motivate this with this particular example. Let's take a case where we actually know that all the outputs are one. Uh, we are running it to see which model performs well. Uh, we have three different kinds of models. So these are completely made up numbers. I'm just telling it for illustrative purposes. Uh, they all give 70% accuracy. So we see that some model works well for the top half. And we did, it's very random. So they all give extra, the same amount of result. But then there's an easy way where you can go take those inputs, the outputs of your previous model, and then get something better, which gives you 90% accuracy, which is just taking the voting 
of your individual models. Uh, this is, in a sense, the most simplistic version of an ensemble. Uh, it provides better accuracy than what you currently have. Uh, the reason why we'll have to use that is the same thing that I showed uh, in this slides. We have more models, we have more parameters, and we have features. So what you can do is you can, one possible approach is you can try all these combinations, run different models, and have different outputs like this, and have CPU as a proxy for human intelligence. Uh, I mean, that's just exaggerating it, but it's just searching in a very interesting way, a smart way of exploring the entire solution space. Uh, okay, so is it is it really something new that's been developed in the machine learning community now? Um, not really. It's been around for, for a long time. Uh, if, if you guys have used Random Forest, that's that is actually one of the uh, that that's a very powerful ensemble model. So that that's been around from I think 1991 or something like that. So academia and researchers have used it for a, for a long time. It was not used in the industry until in 2007. Netflix hosted its competition, and the winners used ensemble models to win. And and from there on, it it really caught up in the industry. And now. Whatever you see, uh, so th this is one of the reasons, one of the things which really motivated a lot of people to you know about ensemble models and do it in the industry. But also, a lot of uh, things happen in, in the computer space. We, we started getting multi-core processors. We started having parallel architectures. Uh, OK, so now we'll motivate what an ensemble model is. So we have input data. We can we fit different kinds of models. And we need to have a way to combine the models to get the final prediction. In your normal approach, what you would do is you just have one input data, you would take a model, and then you would get the output. So you wouldn't have these set of processes at all. Th this is a process where you're going to do a lot more stuff. Um, so the advantages of, the, of this is that you get improved accuracy. Um, is it always the case? Not necessarily, but more, most of, more often than not, it's, it gives better accuracy. Uh, it's robust, so if you know about bias variance, uh, it, it, help, it works on the variance part, it eliminates, it reduces the variance, so it handles that really well. And, and the, the most important thing is the center process is parallelizable, so uh, it, it helps you run a lot of experiments, get a lot of models, and make it run. Uh, you, can, you can see that there are two key ingredients to this process. One is having different kinds of models. Another is how do you combine those models to get an output. OK, so now when you create models, they all shouldn't be same. Your base models, they call base models. Diversity of the models is the most important thing. Uh, what's the most common, what are the most common ways to get uh, different base models? You can use different training sets. Uh, you can randomize your training set for every run of your same model. You can take different features of your data set, so you can use only 20% or 30% or 70% of your data set to do it. Uh, you can try different algorithms, so you can use tree-based models, you can use ne neural networks, you can use linear regression, you can use different kinds of stuff. Every algorithm has its own set of parameters called hyperparameters. Uh, that's something that needs to be optimized. Uh, so when you do this, you can play around with it to figure out for these for one particular set of those what is the optimal hyperparameters, and you can run this experiment a number of times. Uh, so examples of hyperparameters. For example, you run a random forest. The number of trees that you need to fit is a hyperparameter. Uh, uh, you can also set the number of columns you want to take and the number of rows you want to take. Most of the algorithms have all of these things, in some sense, built in. So uh, the second part of it is to how do you aggregate models using these things. Uh, the most common ways, voting, is what we first saw as a motivating example. You can take average or weighted average to do it. Uh, Bagging is bootstrap aggregation. Random forest does that. Uh, stacking, I'll, I'll explain stacking in a bit. But uh, bootstrap aggregation is you, you bootstrap your samples 
multiple times and you run the same model many times and you randomize your result, your model to get the output. Uh, stacking works something like this where uh, you have different models, classifiers of different models that you have. Uh, you take the output of each individual model as input to your next level model. So you, the output of your previous model is the input to the next model. Uh, you can also use the features of those things with it, or you can just use just the outputs to do it. it this, is, this process is called stacking. Uh, so example would be this would be a random forest, linear regression, gradient boosting, and you can just use a simple logistic regression to get an output. So that's, that's the way it works. Um, okay, so we talked a lot of theory. So where is Python fitting into the center picture? Um, uh, this picture summarizes a lot of stuff that happens. Uh, we have different base models that, that you can fit. You can fit neural networks. You can fit gradient boosting. You can do uh, it, all the models from scikit-learn. Uh, they all go into this process where you create your features. Uh, your hyperparameter optimization happens here. Uh, and once you have finalized your different kinds of models, so each of the models can be run in parallel. So you have libraries which helps you run each of the models in parallel. So each model is independent of the other. They run in parallel, and they all have the same process that happens. And you have some feature processing, and then your hyperparameter optimization. Once you have that, you have outputs of all your model. You need to find what the weights for your individual models are, if you're using weighted average or just voting. Uh, we have a library like Hyperopt, which lets you define your own objective on what you want to do. So a common objective that you want to do is you'll have cross-validation. You'll keep some uh, data set as your holdout, and you would try to see what your uh, what's the optimal combination of your weights, which minimizes your error. Um, some code snippets that I thought was really cool to show is that if you have a, a randomized search is your routine for getting your random your hyperparameters. So hyperparameter optimization is not is not a simple thing. There's various combinations that can happen. To, to get something like that. It's, uh, so you, a randomized search cross-validation searches for only certain sets of your parameters. So you, spe you specify what all you want to specify. This is an example of random forest. So uh, you can specify, I'm sorry. So you can specify what your uh, hyperparameters need to be. And then for various combinations, the models run. And whichever combination has the least amount of error is taken as the final model of this particular process. Uh, so once you have different models, the second stage is to use hyperopt. It's 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 a uh, routine for doing parallel optimization over search spaces. Uh, it, it has basically three things. So you, you would define an objective, what you want to minimize. Uh, mostly it will be your error metric that you want to minimize your area under the curve or your uh, least square error. That, that's the thing that you would define here. Uh, you'll have different models, and you're going to call the function which tries to minimize that objective function over your uh, the space that you have provided. Um, so to run the models in parallel, like what we have seen here, so uh, scikit-learn has something called joblib. Now it helps you serialize the uh, output values, so the model is saved on the disk, so you don't need to uh, run it every time you want to fetch it. So it, it's, it's, it works in a good way. And it helps you run multiple models, so you can use that to so this is an example, right? So you can you, you run random forest and it get it lets you save the object and you can have this run multiple uh, threads of various models. Uh, okay, so ensemble models they have its own disadvantages too. Um, it it's not so readable. It has uh, because you do a lot of optimization over it. Sometimes regulations might want you to build something very simple, which regulators can understand. So uh, those things aren't um, easy to do. So 
if accuracy is an important thing, if you want to build the best possible model, then you need to all this sort of all this stuff. The next thing is is also depending on your on your use case that you use. Maybe the time and effort it takes to run a model to improve the accuracy may not be worth the effort. So it, 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 these things really take a lot more time because you have so many models, so many parameters to optimize, and you do at multiple levels. You, you first do a model optimization, hyperparameter optimization for the model. Then c combination of the models again is done. So you, there are multiple stages where things happen. So um, maybe it, it does take a lot more effort. Mm. Th that's all I have. So if you have any questions? Hi. Uh, could you go to the slide of the stacking? Uh, yeah, sure. <coughs> yeah. So the way I know it is that when you sort of train one of these classifiers, you use cross-validation to hyper-tune its parameters. Would you use cross-validation on the entire set of models or on each model yeah, separately? So, so, okay. So, yeah, you would do that. Yes. So you would, uh, you would split your uh, data. For example, uh, what you would do is you would take uh, and I'll, let me give an example. So you'll take 60% of your data to build your base models. So that would be your first level of models. Uh, so you would build random forest or logistic regression, all these first level of classifiers using the 60% of data. On the 60% of the data, you would again do cross-validation to get your hyperparameters. So now you have the next 40% which you have not seen. You would use that as an input for your second stage model. So the, So you would use uh, that model to predict what the probability would be for those 40 percent, and then you would use that as an input to your classifier and then execute it. So, uh, so again, there are two approaches. So either you just use only uh, the output that you get for those models, or you in also include the features. So these are called meta features, which feeds into your next stage model, and then you use your normal features too. So you can, com you can combine these two to uh, feed into your model, your next stage model. Uh, again, here you would use cross-validation to, to do it. So if you, if you don't have like big data, you can, you can sample this multiple times. You can run this many times to get what your generalization error is. So you can, the 60, 40% can be repeated 10 times to get what your, uh, what the, what your generalization error for your generalization bound for your model is. So you can do that. Uh, but if your model is really, I mean, if, it, if your data is really huge, maybe you wouldn't probably be able to do it because the run itself takes a long time. Each run takes a long time. So. Anybody else have a question? I mean, these days, if you, if, if you, want, if you take part in Kaggle competitions or something like that. This is the go-to modeling strategy for for anyone who wins it. So that's. Uh, um. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. Okay. Thanks.